good morning dear friends my name is devan pabaru and uh, we are about to have a conversation on a very interesting topic which is the golden spiral strategy and we are as a panel i have an esteemed panel with me going to discuss this for a next hour or so we will also have question answers at the end of the session the subject is very fast in terms of its evolution offers lot of opportunities for us to look at it from the industry perspective and i have lot of people from the industry here what is golden spiral strategy that i'll i'll just come to let me just first introduce the panel that i have mr girija shankar is a seasoned general management executive with multidisciplinary experience across enterprise value chain in logistics consulting and technology ecosystems he is chief sales and solutions officer at tvs supply chain solutions market he is also chief operating officer at service pairs division fast growing up within tvs scs india prior to tvs mr girija shankar served as executive director and partner digital at ibm he i am sure will bring a service providers perspective to the solutions that are relevant in today's context after that i have bishwajyoti barat he is the vertical head of beauty and grooming business of big basket he has 16 18 years of core experience in category management business development of new businesses startups and worked with several famous retail brands like reliance retail more big bazaar home shop 18 and he has again been extensively involved in this new world of ondc after that we have ram kumar arumugam he is the principal of instamart at swiggy he is a seasoned it leader with 18 plus years of experience in it product program and engineering management he holds an impressive track record of leading all phases of diverse and complex technology it programs in supply chain logistics e-commerce merchandising insurance and pharmaceutical market research industries mr dinesh futane he is a senior director supply chain at herbalife nutrition and he has 20 years of end to end functional experience he works or he has worked with several famous companies like larson and tobro bhartiya cutler hammer abb omron industrial g intelligent platforms essilor india together i think we should look at a very interesting session the way we will structure it is that i'll set the context i'll request each of my panel members to share their opening remarks we will have a conversation for about 20 minutes amongst ourselves and open questions and after that we will open up the questions to the audience so first to begin with what is this golden spiral strategy some of the points are mentioned but golden spiral strategy what it is expected to do in a nutshell is bring the current way of trade in india and when i say trade i don't only mean the conventional understanding of trade is b2c you know we have ordered something for an amazon or a flipkart or a swiggy or a zomato we are talking of trade of all types which means if i have to book a taxi from let's say haridwar to badrinath then i would actually go on an ondc platform and book a taxi trip from let's say haridwar railway station all the way to badrinath the buyer and the seller are on different apps and perhaps are not even aware of which app i may be on clear trip or make my trip the seller of the service may be on uttarakhand tourism app and both the buyer and the seller interact through and there is an enablement of payment system so there is a payment app in this case there could be another level of uh, a credit being offered by a credit card company on that same uh, ondc platform so the idea is to facilitate all types of trade transactions this would mean categories which are 
hitherto not even at this point of time connected on any e-commerce platform. India, just to give you some statistics, has about 16 million MSMEs are already registered in a, in a app called Udyam, which is something like a KYC for an MSME. So intention of ONDC platform will be also to facilitate trade for these MSMEs who are perhaps not even exposed to e-commerce or they don't know how to do this right now or they're too small. The government of India is also exploring a possibility and doing this in a, in, a, in a span of next three to four months that any MSME which wants to participate in this growth story anywhere in the country should be able to do that. ONDC is something that all of us may have heard of. Today you will hear a lot more about it. The idea of trade migrating to this world in which the transactions are transparent, interoperable, as well as they are enabled. This is not only integrated nationally, this is also global integration. The other uh, empowerment that would come to the entire SMEs and the ecosystems, uh, if you are a startup, if you are an SME, you can participate in this. It will also help in cross-border facilitation so that you can very easily export or import. The financial regulatory framework is also expected to play a role in it, which means that digital payments, data protection, consumer protection, foreign direct investment can also come in via this taxation, intellectual property rights, all of these will have a role to play in making ONDC platform a comprehensive platform for facilitating trade across borders also. The other expectation that uh, this particular uh, way of world is uh, expected to bring in is innovative service models. How do you attract, retain, and grow the e-commerce and the e-commerce consumption segments across uh, various segments as I mentioned. So how do you make it easy for a consumer to interact and purchase whatever he or she wants? Partnerships, ONDC is also expected to bring a boost to the kind of partnerships for both scale as well as growth. Partnerships between logistics and delivery partners, technology and data partnership, strategic brand partnership, cross-border partnership, startup and incubator collaborations, government and industry collaborations, research and academic collaborations. So ONDC is not just a platform whereby you will get some delivery at home. It is expected to create uh, infrastructure and bring the current modern trade, one, so that it becomes inclusive and everybody gets to participate in the growth. And the second thing, I think, which is to connect domestic and cross-border trade through this transparent platform. This being the intent, the panelists are expected to, and they will talk about their experiences, they will also talk about the opportunities, they will talk about the challenges and how they view as some of the solutions which are likely to emerge, and then we'll open it out to the audience here. Girija. Thank you, Devin, uh, and thank you to CII for the opportunity to talk about the subject. It's a very interesting subject, of course. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure all of you guys are hearing the uh, recent news and the, a bit of a hype around the subject that we are seeing. Um, I think the way I look at it, uh, uh, clearly ONDC is probably uh, doing what uh, e-commerce did to brick and mortar um, 10 odd years ago. Uh, but I think the way ONDC's architecture and the, uh, the conceptual design is, uh, it's very different from the way e-commerce came in. E-commerce allowed for uh, principle to reach a consumer without having to go through a disaggregated or varied supply chain or a customer reach, so whether it is um, 
you know, getting to connect with the customer for the purchase experience or getting to work with the partners or supply chain for the distribution and reach of the good, uh, it, it in a way aggregated what was disaggregated. And that created pl level playing field for someone like, let's say, Girija Shankar wants to go sell shampoo. Uh, and in a pre-e-commerce era, you could not because you needed to uh, reach to a customer, uh, you can't do a TV ad, uh, and once the customer places an order, you can't really match the reach of a Levers or a PNG or somebody like that. And therefore, the level playing field was brought in by the e-commerce guys by acting as that intermediary layer that allowed for uh, uh, any principal or any manufacturer or trader to reach a customer, right? Uh, we've all seen the phenomena, we've all seen how it has transformed the way we look at uh, uh, channel today, as an example. I, I think what ONDC is doing is in a way flipping it. It's, it's creating, uh, and then there's a lot of obviously water that has to flow down the bridge, but it's, it's creating that aggregated model where certain principles now play the oversized role to be broken apart into re respective component and allowing for um, small, medium, or a large organization on this side uh, to connect with the consumer on that side without having to go through that one large intermediary, right? So the, the opportunities are fantastic, as Devin said. Uh, the use cases are uh, very, very varied. What we're seeing right now is obviously a sliver of the use case as just the hyper-local food delivery, but the broader ramifications are huge. Uh, having said that, uh, I think the whole model itself has a, a fair degree of um, uh, need to under, you know need to uh, create uh, the same experience that you get with a aggregated principle or an intermediary uh, that that same experience has to get translated into the experience uh, in this disaggregated model right uh, so something as simple as let's say if today somebody is able to commit a, a delivery tat uh, because that delivery experience is a controlled experience, controlled by that intermediary, how do you do the delivery experience when multiple disparate organizations uh, with varying level of maturity are playing? And that allows for uh, the same you know, user experience. Because if user experience is varied or is it it's a notch below, then adoption will become an issue, right? Uh, or something as simple as, let's say, uh, looking at the way the listings are and identifying which particular uh, you know service provider or the, the type of goods or the service we are taking uh, is is a is 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 a, let's say better ranked and therefore could be uh, because there's a role that is played by that intermediary today in allowing you to figure out which particular prioritization to go with and things like that uh, uh, and therefore there is a probably a large open question at this stage in the way, in my view, the, the architecture is that it's solved for the tech interoperability. It, to a degree, allows for uh, multiple people on this side to connect with multiple people on that side without having to go through a single intermediary, right? In a way, uh, if you go back to the UPI era, what NPCI did, right? NPCI acted as that clearing house that allowed for uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, money transfers. And that became the basis of the entire Aadhaar uh, framework that we are all very familiar with. Uh, now, that same thing, as far as the digital transactions are concerned, the digital part of the transaction is concerned, is doable, quite doable, because Aadhaar itself becomes a ready base on which you can build on. Uh, but a similar model or an architecture is needed for the physical part of the activity, physical part of the activity in terms of uh, being able to deliver the goods, physical part of the activity in terms of managing returns, physical part of the activity in terms of uh, managing you know, fraud or spurious product, and, and so and so forth. All the variety of things that today uh, we take for granted in a orchestrated environment uh, will need to therefore be orchestrated uh, because there is today no principle in between. 
And uh, to that extent, uh, I think the, the jury is out and uh, the play will always probably unfold and possibly in a manner that we may not be able to envisage today. Uh, but I think uh, there's a lot of, uh, lot of work that will still need to go in. Uh, and I think frameworks will need to emerge, particularly in and around the governance aspect of how, uh, how the framework will work uh, and how we will ensure that quality of service, quality of goods remain consistent. Uh, but I think uh, on the other side, the opportunity, as we started by saying, is tremendous because, uh, as, as Devin said, you know, the number of organizations that are there in India, and, and particularly if you look at India compared to any other, even a Thailand or a, let's say, um, you know, Scandinavian market, any other which you would call as not so developed market, the number of uh, SMEs that we have in India as a percentage of the total uh, enterprise population is significant. So therefore, this is needed from an Indian standpoint, clearly. And uh, therefore, uh, if a framework like that actually starts to work, and even if the use cases to begin with are relatively few, I think it creates a tremendous amount of opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, CA Logistics, for this opportunity. And I thank Devin and Girija for the opening note and their thoughts. So I'll talk about, from my perspective, on how I view UPI versus ONDC. And and few uh, myths about you know ONDC and uh, is it a disruptor or not a disruptor and where are we heading to? Um, first thing is uh, there is only one commonality between ONDC and UPI because a lot of people are comparing UPI versus ONDC. The only commonality is both are public digital good, but ONDC is not UPI. So what UPI did to fintech, ONDC will do to e-commerce, but both are not the same. Uh, the share, the only re possible reason is uh, UPI is heavily technology driven and we have very manual, in manual intervention on the UPI is very less. But, whereas if you talk about ONDC, there are a lot of, you know, players involved like sellers, buyers, logistics providers where we still have a lot of manual effort connecting the dots going on. So that's where ONDC will not be like UPI. But where ONDC will play a larger role is to connect the different sellers, buyers together and forms the spiral. You know, that's where the ONDC is gonna head to. And a good thing is we just started scratching the surface. So a few, you know, data points in terms of, uh, we've already discussed in the morning, the, e the retail penetration is just 4.3%. And what I see is uh, in India, uh, almost 12 to 13 million sellers are making their livelihoods by trading. And interestingly, only 15,000 of them are enrolled in e-commerce platforms, is organized or unorganized. So that is one of the big gap that uh, ONDC will try and address. We'll try and bring more sellers on board, whether you want to buy uh, you know, shampoo, you want to buy uh, anything, right, uh, as an e-commerce product. Uh, if I'm a seller, I can go and list my store, a Karana store on ONDC, I can start selling products. So that is the main objective or motto of ONDC to democratize e-commerce and uh, you know uh, uh, give good quality products uh, you know the consumers and there are a few aspects that still needs to be considered in terms of you know uh, and Girija Shankar spoke about you know the quality you know of the products that customer wants. Uh, uh, I always think about uh, some of the aspects of uh, you know what Jeff Bezos said. Instead of thinking about what is going to change, we always we are, at times we also should think about what is not going to change. Uh, will your customers expect uh, delivery you know, late tomorrow? No, your customers are gonna expect delivery sooner than yesterday, right? That is something that is not gonna change. Another thing what is not gonna change, the quality, right? So the customers are always gonna expect good quality products and their perception about quality will never go down. I am a customer, I always expect good quality products from Flipkart, Amazon, or maybe Swiggy, Zomato, whatever, right? So that, you know, understanding of the buying behavior will never going to change the expectation on, you know, all these platforms or sellers are going to increase over a period of time. So that is something that we will drive all of these platforms, uh, you know, uh, to the future. Uh, second thing is in terms of uh, the listing, right? So uh, right now, food players are there on ONDC and there are a lot of Kirana stores that got on onboarded to ONDC. 
But how about you maintain, uh, you know, uh, you know the corrections, or I would say the quality of listings on ONBC. Uh, right now, there is no single ownership, or there's a framework as compared to, you know, aggregator, for example, Amazon or Flipkart. They own the end-to-end, -end, you know, the supply chain from all the way to sourcing, all the way to delivery. And right now, this is kind of an unbundling of all of these experiences. Right, so you have a seller on one side, you have a buyer on one side, you have a third party logistics. ONDC gives a very good platform for flexibility for consumers. Say for example, um, let's say if I want to buy a product in uh, ONDC, I can choose between Dunzo, delivery, different third party logistics, whichever is cost efficient for me. Uh, whereas those cost efficient is actually packaged in, you know, in an Amazon or a Flipkart because they own and manage their end to end you know, supply chain. So this ONDC provides a flexibility through unbundling, but there's also a lot of you know, questions around who will own the end-to-end -end customer experience. Right now we see the customer experience, uh, if I have to put it bluntly, it is fragmented, correct? So you have a customer experience on a seller side, you have a customer experience on a buyer side, and there is a logistics customer experience, right? Right now this is probably an area of you know, concern for most of the you know, consumers where you want to go buy something in ONDC, uh, you have to experiment and figure out how your experience is. And by default, you know, always compare that with the likes of Flipkart and Amazon, right? So how is your customer experience going to be with the likes of, you know, the big players? And that is something that uh, the ONDC will try to solve over a period of time. Uh, so when we onboard more, you know, sellers, buyers, right, we improve on these delivery quality aspects and we build some you know, regulations and frameworks around this and who will govern what. So in, let's say if you get a bad quality of product, who will be the owner? Will a buyer, be, uh, will a seller be the owner? Or who will you probably penalize for, or a logistic provider? Right now, that framework is yet to be built. So that is something that we will evolve over a future or a period of time. Um, and second thing is the quality of listings, right? So right now, the product category is well managed by the likes of Flipkart and Amazon. So you go buy search or uh, any products that you want to go and search in Amazon and Flipkart, it is all completely owned, you know, automated by the likes of them. But when you actually look at ONDC, how the product discovery happens is quite different from the organized players. So that is where another, let's say if you are a Kirana store, you want to go and onboard yourself in ONDC, how, what is the probability of your store getting listed on the first page or first instance? That's still a question. Right, the product discovery or you know the uh, store discoveries uh, still needs to be you know you know fine tuned, correct? So that is also another aspect, and another aspect I would say is from a seller standpoint. So how efficient the sellers will be, you know, uh, ensuring their uh, you know products are available, the inventory is available all the time, correct? So because Amazon, Flipkart, they have you know good quality algorithms, they have a lot of you know uh, automation systems in place that fine tunes, you know, or predicts the availability of goods at any point in time in their warehouses, right? And they display that this, you know, it is available, not available to you. But that kind of robustness or rigor needs to come into every seller, right? Because I'm a seller, I'm a Kirana store, it is, the onus is on me to ensure the inventory is always available in my store for the discoverability perspective. So that is also another aspect. Uh, logistics, again, uh, right now it is kind of unbundled, so you can go and choose your own logistics to get your products delivered at your doorstep. And uh, another aspect is, uh, how do you handle reverse logistics in ONDC, right? So for the likes of organized players, you have very good mechanism of reverse logistics where you either drop it in some designated points or people will come to you to pick up the goods that you don't want. But how reverse logistics is gonna happen here? So that's also another, area of you know, thoughts, concerns, right? Uh, especially in terms of fashion, and right? let's say if you fashion stores are coming onto ONDC, then that is another area of discussions or you know, uh, frameworks needs to come in place in terms of how you handle reverse logistics. So those are some of the you know, key areas that ONDC will try and address over a period of time. And you know, it's interesting times that we've just, like I said in the beginning, we've just scratched the surface and there's a lot of things that uh, ONDC will provide to the sellers and buyers and creating this golden spiral. And of course the cross border trade will also enable and it's just not, not the commerce players that will come here. We also need uh, financial players like you know, the likes of banks, UPIs, those also will have to come together. Right? It's basically an ecosystem is what uh, you know, ONDC is trying to create. 
not just a commerce. It's just like a pure trade ecosystem uh, through digital, right? So that is where uh, ONDC will, you know, play a larger role in future. And uh, um, and uh, another thing is, uh, there's a lot of, you know, chatter and news also that ONDC is, is a price play. I would probably a little bit differ on the pricing aspects of ONDC because it's, my view is, it is more of integration of different players and uh, not just the pricing aspect. You would probably uh, incentivize right now, but in the long run, it's, uh, it is somebody has to bear the cost. So that is something that we will evolve over a period of time. And the customers, again, uh, Indian market is always price conscious, but definitely the pricing pressure will always be there across different platforms, be it organized or unorganized. Uh, it's just the nature of uh, our buying pattern, right? I think we've seen in the morning also the pricing pressure is still going to drive the e-commerce, right? But it is just that pricing alone will not be a you know key aspect here, right? Uh, the aspect of ONDZ is to again democratize commerce to buy, by bringing in MSME players together. So uh, those are some some of my uh, you know thoughts in terms of how ONDZ is probably will evolve over the next like five six years. And thank you. Good morning, friends. So 1980s, okay, uh, internet uh, became a revolution, okay. Uh, with the 80s, uh, advent of internet, the communication became, it became very easy, okay. Early 2000, we start, start uh, we, we uh, saw the uh, advent of e-commerce, okay, and over a period of next 20 years, we could see how the e-commerce industry has revolutionized the way we uh, purchase our products, okay. Even though uh, uh, last 15, 20 years e-commerce has developed, but we could see that still a large part of our business are done by the brick and mortar stores. Okay, e-commerce has probably penetrated only probably 15 to 20 percent of the market, predominantly in tier one and tier two cities, and probably a little more deeper. But as we go in still deeper into the country, okay, still the brick and mortar stores is what it is there. Not only in country like India, which is developing. But again, when you look at even the Western world, still there are huge brick and mortar stores run by huge uh, organized retail uh, companies, okay? So uh, basically, uh, ONDC is going to, what it's going to do for India is, it's going, to, this, this platform is going to be taken to the smaller cities, basically. Most of the bigger cities, tier one, tier two cities, many of the players are basically aware of how to get into, uh, many of them are aware about how uh, uh, they are technologically savvy people are there. Even when you look at the people who are into the retail world, they know about the technology. As you go deeper into the country where there is still a dearth of understanding how the technology works, probably this is where probably ONDC can help the rural India to get into an online platform, okay, where it will help them to penetrate deeper markets, okay. What does uh, e-commerce made is it has made the consumers basically uh, the accessibility to consumers has increased. Probably a few years back, a premium product was available only for people staying in metros and tier one cities. Today, a premium or a luxury product can be accessed even by a person sitting in a remote of the village in case he's got the purchasing power. Okay, probably a few years back, if somebody needs to buy a premium clothing or a premium shoes, they need to come to their main cities to buy it. But today, sitting at their homes in remote part of the world, they can have access to the products, okay? So what ONDC is going to do is, it's going to do support the same way, not for the consumers, but for the sellers, okay? Probably every seller may not get an opportunity to sell in the more established e-commerce industries, but uh, this platform is going to create them an opportunity to get onboarded and uh, increase their reach to the sellers, okay? Probably within their own geographies or probably uh, to the wider uh, uh, industry. So this is going to be today, uh, like my friends have already spoken, ONDC has just been a platform which has been established to create a level playing field uh, for the small uh, MSMEs, SMEs to compete with the larger aggregators, okay? but. Uh, the currently the framework is very, very loosely knit, like uh, Ram has said that how the reverse logistics will be managed, how the spurious products will be managed, 
because with the large e-commerce companies, these are all well-organized companies which has certain processes to manage these activities, okay? So uh, ONDC will take probably a couple of more years uh, for us to see the benefit of how a small time uh, retail Kirana shop owner can take advantage and extend his reach to, uh, to increase his business, okay? So probably this is going to be the next revolution as far as India is concerned for the smaller businesses, for the smaller city, the sellers who are into the smaller cities, uh, uh, which is going to help their uh, business, okay? So uh, this is uh, uh, if, uh, this is a platform which is going to uh, revolutionize in the next couple of years. We need to wait and watch how this entire platform is going to support the entire logistics end-to-end -end function. Okay, uh, how the seller is able to identify a logistics partner, how the seller is going to create a visibility, what product he is going to sell, and how the uh, how the deliveries is going to happen to the end customer. And in case if there are any rejections, how the reverse logistics will happen and uh, how this will be reshipped. And again, when it comes to supply chain, I think most of you are from the supply chain background. It's always a challenge between maintaining the cost as well as the service, okay? Uh, how, how a small time retailer will manage his service at the same time, maintain his profitability, okay? Because the larger companies, larger aggregators, e-commerce companies, can probably take a loss for a few years, okay? But whether a small SME or a small retailer can take a loss for his returns if, if a product has been rejected. Today, in an e-commerce world, basically uh, there are huge returns, especially in the fashion industry, probably around 25% returns are there. And in case a small retailer who's into the retail of uh, garments or a fashion industry, can he take these kind of returns? Will it be profitable for him? So these are all, these questions are still not answered in uh, ONDC, okay? It's a, it's a small step taken by the government to create a level playing field for uh, the small time retailers, Kirana shop owners, and uh, people who cannot really compete with the e-commerce companies. But only time will tell how beneficially this will be, not only for the, uh, the small time business owners, but even for the consumers also. But I think as we say that, change is the need of the hour, so ONDC is one of the things which is going to be uh, a revolutionary uh, uh, step by the government, but only time will say how successful this platform will be because there is no one single entity who is going to manage this platform, okay? So it's an open platform and uh, uh, it's, it's who's going to uh, control uh, these things, okay? So uh, this is my thoughts on ONDC and uh, probably only as I said that only probably next three, four years will really tell us whether this platform will be a successful model in India or we will continue to <coughs> have companies like uh, the uh, established e-commerce companies. Now that there are uh, earlier, probably a few years back, we had a few companies. Today, many of the companies are expanding into e-commerce model. Not only e-commerce, <coughs> a lot of companies are getting into D2C model also. Okay, so there are specialist companies today in the fashion world or there are multiple companies who are into D2C model, okay? So we need to see how this e-commerce world will, um, again, comp how ONDC will be, whether it will be complementing the e-commerce industry or it will be like, it will be a disruptive uh, uh, technology for the smaller uh, uh, retailers. This is my thoughts and uh, thanks a lot. <coughs> Hi everyone. So let me start with a, you know, the story and the evolution of the, you know, the markets basically. If you see traditionally India being a land of retailers, even forget about, you know, GTMT e-commerce, these big words, you know, during the Maharaja times also we used to have, you know, bazaars, hearts where, you know, the local products used to sell and those used to be, you know, really good quality products. However, over the period of time, what, why there's a need of a ONDC, let me just tell you first, like there's a place called Pipli near Odisha, where there are so many, you know, handicraft products are so famous, so well-defined, high quality products, but those products are not available today on any of the e-commerce. 
let's talk about you know in rajasthan the you know the wooden toys wooden products or maybe the handicraft products which is like your you know uh, the bed sheets cushions right all of them the same material is not available on any of the e-commerce even let's take an example of chennapatnam you know near mysore we have you know so many you know uh, wooden toys wooden products or hanging wind chimes these products are not available why this is not available that we need to answer first this is not available because the cost of the products is very low and the moment it has to go on any e-commerce the moment you start putting all your factors of pnl where we discuss about the packaging then the inventory holding cost then you know the reverse logistics and logistics and refund it becomes a bomb a 200 product 200 rupees product becomes a, a sweet pricely you know mentioned on the e-commerce portal as 999 right these are the issues where the need of ondc is coming up however there are certain things need to be addressed in the forum of ondc like i'll be talking about more from the category perspective like the buying experience let's talk about today if we look at the product description pages content is one of the most important part in e-commerce that's your sales manager you must have seen the promoter standing on a offline who is actually convincing you the product description page is the sales manager in e-commerce world actually if you look at right now in ondc product description page doesn't even exist there is no such content which engage engages you in terms of you know to convert you as a buyer there has to be you know the dimensions to be mentioned of the product which you intend to buy there has to be the ingredients you know which are given in the products everything has to be well defined in the product description page then only the scalability and the conversion might increase another aspect of uh, product description page is the video and ar ai unless it's a if it is a high engagement product if it is not a low involvement product you need video to see for how many racks are there how many you know for for example if it is a ac or refrigerator you want to have a visual appeal of the product then only you will buy so ondc it's not about only food delivery or ola uber or something else it's more to do with you know how you scale up the product selling across the genres like electronics mobile food then other service providers as well second part i wanted to touch upon is the while browsing through the pages you need lot of you know technology driven aspect like similar product to be shown which you are searching then only the cross selling might happen across the category and across the product then similar color suggestions if you are buying you know lipstick on ondc there has to be if you are searching only red lipstick you need to see red lipstick across the brands right so these kinds of technological interventions are really requ required on the product description pages otherwise conversion might be a problem on ondc coming to the next point of customer care today if we talk about from the lens of customer experience or customer centricity chat chatbots timely resolution refunds tracking of consignment inquiry regarding the products for example i want to buy a ac now i am not i am bit confused with the product description pages or some of the details i wanted to call the customer care and understand whether it's a five star rated product or whether you know it's a inverter ac or what would be the you know length of the copper wire in the ac right these are the questions which we call the customer care of amazon flipkart and other portals and we understand like okay these are the things and then only we make the transaction on the portal however so far if you look at from the customer care experience these things are completely missing on ondc and there is a great need of you know enhancement on these portions next i would touch upon on the search currently on ondc it's completely counterintuitive because if you are if you wanted to buy a product first of all you should know which product you wanted to buy today what is happening it is listed based on the stores so maybe it's it's my personal belief it should be like the product should appear first and then it should have the stores listed with the kilometer wise you know range rather than having a store because the first product or store which is appearing on the ondc it might be you know 8 kilometers away it's not 1 or 2 kilometers from your house so the search and the listing needs to be given preference so that the conversion increases otherwise people will be keep 
scrolling through different, different pages and finally they will end up buying somewhere else. The scalability will be completely missing. Then obviously, when we are talking about such a mammoth infrastructure of ONDC where everything will be available, where are the filters? The refinement of search can be done through filters. Huge number of filters need to be added, like whether it is kilometer wise, whether it's a product driven, like, you know, if you're buying an AC, first of all, you, you know, decide whether you wanted to buy a split AC or you wanted to buy a window AC, what kind of star rating you require, whether it's an inverter AC or normal AC, everything you need to, you know, refine your search. And after that, you get hundreds of products. You need to choose, a, you know, from those hundreds of products. So that kind of refinement of search is really need for an ONDC kind of infrastructure. Then whether it's a price based or discount based, you know, search, those kinds of filters are really required because when we are talking about such a huge, you know, uh, genre of products will be available and also, you know, the number of SKUs will be very high. You need a very good refinement mechanism to ensure that you are zeroing down on specific products and then you are actually you know getting converted as a buyer coming to the last point of packaging majorly i see there's a huge gap right now you know where ondc needs to work upon and you know a lot of people needs to give their inputs you know industry needs to give their input for ex for example if you get an order right how the retailer is supposed to pack it whether they are supposed to use a, a plastic bubble wrap, whether they are supposed to use a three-ply, four-ply, what kind of corrugated box it should be, right? So there is a need of, you know, somehow people should understand the, the need of education is required with the retailers. The requirement, the technicalities of packaging needs to be done for each and every product before handing over to the delivery person. Otherwise, these all might become a counterproductive if these things are not touched upon. Lastly, when we talk about the accessibility, of course, ONDC is going to solve the accessibility problem. A person sitting in Dwarka in Rajasthan, or whether a person sitting in Tawang in Arunachal Pradesh, or a person sitting in, you know, in Tamil Nadu in Kanyakumari or in Kashmir is sitting, he definitely wants to buy the products of those Pipli, which I was giving an example, which is near the, you know, Bhuvaneshwar. Even they want to buy, you know, products of Krishnanagar in West Bengal, where you have very good, you know, clay products, which are not available today anywhere on the e-commerce. So people want to have accessibility and mobility. And I believe accessibility and mobility is the sign of the development in India. And hope ONDC solve and, you know, throw some light on these attributes which I am discussing. And over the period of time, they can work upon on these things. Thank you, everyone. I think uh, one of the things that I noticed is that there are quite a lot of open questions that we are asking, not only to this audience, but also obviously amongst ourselves. And obviously, since it's a spiral, let me just remind that the radius will keep on increasing. And that's why it's called a spiral. And uh, some of the questions, while we will discover and uh, figure out, some of the conversations that I intend doing in the next 15, 20 minutes amongst the panelists is to try and draw upon their experiences and try and come up with some of the things that are there in front of us. So one of the things uh, Girija did mention was that, you know, who will do the orchestration? Who will do the governance? Now, from his prior experience, I know uh, he has worked in digitization and various other similar uh, worlds. This ONDC is not a platform. It's a, it's a marketplace of marketplace. In that sense, there cannot be any owner in, in that. So, and it's a question that uh, will evolve, obviously, or the answers will emerge. But if I, if I ask today, and I am now comparing the physical world to the digital world, who is the owner of the trade today? There are multiple laws which are at, at, at the back, as a backbone of the trade. So, for example, 
in ONDC's context, people are asking that what happens if the consumer is cheated, for example. What do you do today if you are cheated in a normal trade? It's not that cheating does not happen today. So you go to the police, yeah? Now you may be, at least in Bombay, I see that if you are, if let's say you are a victim of a financial fraud, the police also has a digital app kind of a situation available where you can complain. In fact, you don't have to go to the police station. I was recently a victim. Luckily, I didn't lose money because I was quick to go and lodge a complaint. So the complaint can be lodged in about 10 minutes. The bank helped me lodge a complaint, which is also digital. And then I was subsequently told that once this complaint goes to a level, there you may have to visit a police station. Otherwise, at this point of time, to lodge a complaint, there is no visit required to the police station. So my question to Girija is that is the governance or the orchestration, which is already there, can it not come to the ONDC world the way it is there today? And will this not evolve in a similar way as a physical trade is today? No, I think that that's exactly the question I think we, we probably need to grapple on. But let me let me take a say I think the opportunity is fantastic. I don't think uh, you know anybody is saying that look this is this is something that is not doable. It's ambitious. It is seriously ambitious. No two ways about it. Uh, uh, and I think probably the 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 adjective I would use, uh, Devin, is not platform or platform platform, but I would say it's an ecosystem. And by definition, an ecosystem cannot be owned by an entity. Even though you may say a government uh, uh, provides the necessary umbrella around it, but it cannot be owned. Otherwise, it would become Amazon or Flipkart or something like that. Now, but we need we need that ability to do the search. We need the ability to prioritize. We need the ability to manage return. We need all those abilities that today that intermediary does to be orchestrated and dispute resolution and things like that. And I think, uh, I mean, definitely some of this could be driven through smart uh, technical uh, architectures, right? You can have mechanics that drive rating, for example, very, very robust way, which is, uh, uh, you know, which is not necessarily managed by somebody, but it kind of organically grows. And therefore, it has a self-fulfilling or self uh, kind of uh, so those kind of things could come in through a uh, digital interventions. Uh, the other thing would could be that the the framework for governance could be established where uh, you know let's say if you take NPCI again. I mean I, I keep going back to NPCI. Uh, what NPCI did with UPI and the, the entire framework of it uh, was was enable that uh, architecture to flow seamlessly. There's no friction in the system. The system, therefore, becomes much faster, uh, much more reliable, right? Uh, and NPCI actually doesn't own anything, right? Neither does RBI. So all they did was either created a regulatory framework or they established a set of governing rules that allowed for peer-to-peer -peer transfer to happen, right? Now, obviously, it's not the same thing because it's digital versus physical world. But I think if those rule sets are defined, we have a mechanics to implement, execute, uh, monitor in a robust manner, uh, it's not a non-solvable problem in my view, right? Yeah. Thanks. My next question is to Ram Kumar. In terms of how do you think that the customer experience, in your experience, uh, you are obviously chasing customer experience every day in your own network. Yeah. So if, if I have to ask you that, what are the learnings of managing a customer experience and how can they be you know, extrapolated into something which is much bigger? Let's say that if, if I am uh, consuming a service in some other part of the country and if as, as, a, as a salesperson or a, as somebody who is a seller, how do I use some of the principles that have already been understood by companies like yours? And how do I use or how do I make it part of my uh, system as, as part of ONDC? Sure. Hello. Okay. Hello. So 
Okay, so uh, I recently read an interesting book called um, The Best Service is No Service. You know, how do you liberate your customers from customer service, make them happy and control costs, right? <coughs> Sorry. This was based on, uh, you know, uh, how Amazon does the customer service, right? So I'm sure that uh, very few people had had to call Amazon call center for any of the problems with your products. Uh, so that's how they've seamlessly integrated their customer experiences right from your product discovery on the way up to delivery, right? So what 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 is the typical customer demand? It's very simple, post your order, order journey. We call it as post order journey. What is most important for a customer is when will my order come? Simple, right? So that's the most important aspect of any customer demand. So once you go and purchase it, the promise that any of the e-commerce players give us in terms of days or hours, right? That's what you see in an Amazon website or a Flipkart. You will get it no later than some promise, right? So we call that as a promise. Right? So that's the main driver first, uh, you know, in terms of the SLAs, the service levels that every e-commerce players, you know, they do. Be it Swiggy, Zomato, or Big Basket for that matter, right? So that is the trust, I would say, that's not a promise. Over a period of that time, the promise evolves to a trust factor. Right, so the brands that promise trust factors consistently, right? So then that will become a benchmark or probably will become an industry benchmark. Right, so the first part is that trust factor in terms of delivery. Second is how do you address or how do you build the tracking mechanism, right? So when you actually order something, it, it gives you a view of where it is being sourced, where it is being shipped, whether it is at a nodal point, distribution point. You know, you, you, don't, you don't just say the time, right? Because Time doesn't matter anything over a period of time, but I wanted to know where my parcel is at any point in time. So that, so they evolved over a period of time that gives you a confidence that your package is in transit. So you, you are, your kind of anxiety level comes down, right? So the moment that you don't have a visibility into the entire tracking mechanism, your anxiety level goes up, and then you call the customer center, which is unnecessary. So you break that anxiety level down, basically, post-order journey. And then once you get the product, so then you feel the product, right? Basically the quality, be it a grocery or be it a, you know, consumer durables. So whether your product, whatever you see it in the, whatever you saw it in the listings matches with your expectation, correct? If it is, then you are happy. If it doesn't, then the next thing is you actually go for a reverse logistic. So you're gonna file a complaint again. So do, should you call a call center? No, typically you don't. You just go for a returns through the web website, right? So it is all completely technology driven. Right, the entire returns process. So that is where I would say the technology plays a bigger part in terms of, you know, uh, you know, in terms of creating a reliability on uh, the promise and the trust. And the more uh, you, you know, focus on the promise and then uh, deliver on the trust, I think people are going to, you know, you know, come more onto your platform. Basically the network effect, right? That's what will happen more. And then you start to believe in that platform. Basically that is what is, supposed to happen for ONDC too. Uh, you start to believe something that, uh, yeah, ONDC is gonna offer me this, and uh, it has certain predictability. Right? So that is more important for everybody. Because once you establish that kind of a predictability, then it becomes easy, you know, for you know people to come on board and start transacting. So that's how I see the entire customer journey is. And you also have a redressal mechanism, beyond which, I mean, it's not that uh, you can make this 100% efficient, but there are like pockets, like one, two percent, but I still want to, you know, call for a call center, ask for a refund, you'll have to build that kind of a capability also in the system so that your post-order journey becomes seamless, right? So that's my thoughts. My next question is to Vichwa Jyoti. In terms of new categories, you mentioned a lot of categories which are underrepresented, underpenetrated. At the same time, you have consumer segments which are not local and who are keen on those kind of products. So from where you see category management, the way you see it, what uh, do you think that is going to be the future? Will we see far more democratization? For example, how do you think as a category manager that when you see an opportunity that there is X uh, opportunity available because there is new audience available. So it feeds into each other. You have new audience which is available and therefore you have new categories which can be given to them. Do you think that this will help as an organization? I'm talking specifically your organization. 
would you look at something like ONDC to actually be a source of insights into what is being consumed and what is available and therefore marry the two? Will that, do you see that happening? Okay, so in terms of uh, new category, if we talk about, see, underpenetrated categories are like today, we can talk about, you know, the beauty and grocery is one of them. Grocery, I won't say grocery, but grocery in, you know, in T2, I would say. Because in T2, why the grocery, you know, uh, per se is uh, underpenetrated because of the unorganized market, which is still not organized. In And in T1, it's because of, you know, lack of time, lack of, you know, other suitability where people can go and parking issues, they are ordering through e-commerce. But if I have to answer in terms of newer categories, then I don't see any newer category can be doing better on ONDC per se when it, the category itself is new, right? People has less confidence in terms of conversions. So somehow I'm personally looking at ONDC and the existing infra of Amazon Flipkart in this way, like going forward, whether it's a category management or conversion ratio you look at, ONDC uh, or the existing infra, you know, like Amazon and Flipkart will remain as a recruiting genre. And ONDC will be taking the pie from those, cat, you know, companies. Because the moment we talk about converting a customer from MTGT to e-commerce, firstly, people would be looking for trust, which Arun was talking about, then commitment, then, you know, uh, how, you know, the browse experience should be good, then, you know, the customer care, then, you know, the after sale return, these are all coming out from the existing infra. So, when we talk about the recruiting customers on e-commerce, that will be through, you know, whether you call it a newer category, old categories, but I would say through existing platforms and ONDC can cut out the shares, you know, over the period of time as and when they will be, you know, improvising on their infra and the o overall, you know, UI and UX. Thanks. Dinesh, I would like to ask uh, one specific thing in terms of, you m did mention about spurious and, uh, and you know, duplicate, etc. What methods do you see are available today or what precautions as as a company or as an organization that one would take so that the counterfeit or uh, you know duplicates etc don't enter into a supply chain from your vast experience can you throw some light on that <coughs> basically uh with the advent of e-commerce, uh, okay, so it has opened the channel for multiple people who can sell from those platforms. Because when we work with companies like Flipkart, Amazon, or any other e-commerce company, they are basically marketplace. Some of the products, basically, they have certain controls. But because it's a marketplace, it's open for uh, every uh, seller to come into that platform and sell their products, okay? And most of these companies have some kind of due diligence which they make with the sellers. Okay? They look at their uh, uh, data. But that does not give any guarantee that the seller is going to only sell the, the original product or maybe uh, uh, the authentic product. Okay, uh, in my own experience, I've seen that a lot of spurious products are being uh, supplied through these websites. But when these complaints have been raised, there is some kind of mechanism with these organized e-commerce companies where they can blacklist such vendors who are repeatedly who are coming out with spurious or duplicate products or defective products where there is a, some the, the entire platform or the their entire uh, software is developed in such a way where uh, when there is a pattern to a certain vendor when there, it is being seen that the product is being spurious from a particular seller they can blacklist it but when it comes to an open platform uh, like uh, uh, ONDC where uh, the governance and the compliance is still very, very loose, okay? So there is there is a platform which is being created, but who owns the platform, okay? Even if there is somebody who's going to own it, what is the guarantee of uh, the compliance? Uh, the uh, Today, a lot of intellectual property 
has been a lot of emphasis on intellectual property uh, uh, rights. There are a lot of uh, discussion happening uh, at the highest level on uh, data privacy. What securities these kind of platforms which is going to create, okay? Uh, so these are some of the unanswered questions with ONDC right now. That is the reason why I said probably only time will tell whether this is going to uh, revolutionize the way we, uh, the small uh, time sellers uh, will be able to uh, take advantage of this platform or this platform is going to uh, uh, maybe uh, um, will be one more platform for uh, uh, where uh, not uh, not very effective in the market okay, where still the private uh, players will rule the world so with this uh, we have 10 minutes uh, available for question answer we'll be happy to take questions from the audience we will attempt to answer as much as we know and uh, some of it we will attempt to answer assuming the way it will evolve but uh, happy to take questions as a panel so please if you have any questions identify yourself and also define hello. to whom the question is directed to and we'll try and answer hello yeah this is uh, my name is kuldeepak singh i am from godrej and bias uh, so my question is uh, particularly to mr geja right so uh, the upi which uh, indian government has created and uh, giving good results so how do you see the sustenance of this because the government is spending a lot of money around 300 million dollars or so so how do you see the sustaining of this model itself uh, remains uh, there if the government comes out of this marketplace and doesn't own it as you say it is an ecosystem how it will become self sustainable in going future so I think uh, 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 the question really, uh, and I think let me, let me try and discuss a little bit with you. Uh, UPI evolved and UPI has become a fantastic success story. Why did UPI become a success story? Because uh, it allowed, if you, if any of you, I don't know if you, how many of you have seen peer-to-peer, -peer, P2P uh, payment ecosystem, it actually started in uh, Kenya. Um, there was a platform that Vodafone built, it was called M-Pesa. And those was the first use cases globally of large scale P2P uh, model. And when Airtel acquired Zen, they tried bringing that P2P platform into India with Airtel money. It was called something else earlier. It didn't take off. It didn't take off at that time. And the, largely the reason was that both the Kenya model and the Airtel model at that time were operator driven, right? While there was a little bit of that foundational uh, uh, governance framework through RBI, the model didn't really take off because Airtel had to go partner with merchants and uh, uh, give you or me an incentive to use what is known as Airtel money and therefore so and so forth, right? Uh, what UPI did is establish that as a broad-based democratic layer that people like a phone pay or a Bharat pay or a Paytm or anybody would hook on to this side uh, and eventually Google Pay came in and now Amazon Pay. And on the other side, you had the uh, clearing house with NPCI that allowed for the actual clearing to happen on real-time basis. And you could see that if I actually needed to pay 20 rupees and I don't have a change of 100, I could go on to my app and make the transaction. And the one time you make the transaction, you get a success, you make it again and again and again and again, right? So as I think Ram very rightly said, some of this drives bottom up because you see a success story, you see a use case that actually works, you build trust into that framework. So I think, look, I, I'm, I can't say whether ONDC will work or not. But the key for it to work is very clear. It has to be based on bottom up, specific use cases, success stories emerging out of it, you and I as individual users getting the trust in that framework. And then we seeing that, look, it gives me at the least same experience that my any other channel gives me, uh, if not better. And then it's supposed to hopefully organically grow from there. Right? Yeah. Thank you. So one more question to you only. Sorry, coming to you again. So one thing is that there is a talk of open uh, OSEN, that is open credit enabled network. Uh, do you think that it will work as a catalyst uh, to the ONDC and it may uh, kind of help it grow? Uh, 
again, I think on this again, great question. Uh, that's uh, again another ecosystem that's coming in, right? Uh, and there are people in the market as intermediaries, you know, at different level who allow for uh, credit, uh, uh, you know, transferability, if you will, right? Uh, uh, again, I think uh, to a large degree that has to be backed by, uh, you know, your ability to get the credit ratings, your ability to make sure that the transfer happens, minimize the amount of fraud, uh, and goes back to the same point that the experience of a user uh, drives. Again, if you look at India, peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending hasn't taken off, right? Despite all the money that has came in into multiple ventures, some of them tried quite hard, got funding and stuff, uh, largely because uh, the Indian ecosystem has that little bit of that physical touch that drives trust rather than while we are very comfortable talking to an interface called Amazon and ordering from there, the trust is a trust of that interface, not behind, right? Uh, so, so that has to be established before something that comes, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. First of all, uh, thank you, all of you, for this wonderful session on ONDC. So uh, yesterday, I mean, the biggest uh, challenge for uh, e-commerce, what we feel is the logistic cost. Um, I mean, as Dinesh was telling, um, every I mean, uh, entrepreneur, the biggest challenge what we are facing is the e-commerce. Flipkart charges 47 rupees, other company charges 67 rupees. So this biggest challenge. My product cost was 100 rupees. When I approached Flipkart, they told 2% is the uh, okay, uh, what do you call uh, commission charges? 2.5 is the conversion charge. 17 rupees is fixed charge. 47 is, rupees is the logistic cost, and uh, 18 rupees, 18 uh, percent is GST. That comes to 82 rupees. So within 18 rupees, what can I do? Right. So this was the biggest challenge. People like me are scared to get into e-commerce. Secondly, when I looked at ONDC, I mean, uh, still I'm not understanding the business model very honestly. But yesterday, I I see that they have. Uh, uh, partnered with Shadow Facts, uh, right? I mean, for the entire logistics, uh, this one. So, how does it help a uh, uh, new entrepreneur like me? Thank you. So let me attempt. It's a it's a very good question, and it is perhaps the cause or the reason why ONDC is being created and attempted. And here, I'm not going to use any names, but you guys will have to understand that as of today, and I'm going to give a little bit of context. In India, we are a large country, and we are a local supply chain ecosystem, which means that if you grow a particular fruit in MP, it is very difficult for it to travel. Similarly, if you are, as he was mentioning, Channa Patna toys, wooden toys, the cost of the product is 100 rupees. It cannot travel. It cannot become 200, 300. Nobody is going to pay for it. And this is a, is a big chicken and egg problem, as we call it, which is there. Therefore, me to become big, I need demand from multiple other sources. The local demand is not adequate. At the same time, till I become big, how do I pay for that added logistics cost? And what is a platform supposed to do? Now, and that's where a difference between a platform and a network. The cost of delivery or cost of logistics goes down when the density of the demand keeps increasing. And that's the only rule that is applicable, fortunately, unfortunately. That's the way demand and supply work. That's basic economics. If you start getting bigger orders in a same density, Logistics cost is directly proportional to the density. And density is not necessarily of only your product. Density of the product in your geography to the demand geography. And then you have a used infrastructure in the morning also. We were talking about physical and the digital infrastructure. The physical and digital infrastructure at a high scale are supposed to be paper use. So if you consume two rupees worth of logistic services, in a very large truck, then you will be charged only two rupees. At this point of time, unfortunately, all the diseconomies of scale get 
added to somebody who's trying to sell. So a Chenna Patna producer cannot ship it to Kerala because the product will not stand that kind of logistics cost. And this is the fundamental reason why your spiral has to start bringing the cost down. I am not blaming the, uh, the ecosystem today. Ecosystem is doing a fairly, in fact, not fairly, very good job in terms of creating a platform. The very reason we are thinking today of ONDC is that there is a mindset of an e-commerce and a platform which has been established. Till five years back, there is nothing called e-commerce. I come from an organized retail trade. E-commerce was something that we had never thought that it will be like this. So let me tell you, all of us should be very proud of the fact that we have actually jumped, courtesy pandemic and otherwise, have jumped multiple generations. This would have taken 15 years. What we have done in two years perhaps would have taken maybe a decade or more. So all of us have evolved at a very fast pace. And therefore, our expectations are that can we evolve even faster than what we are. And that is one of the attempts. The second question you asked, one is that how do you bring scale to logistics? And that is where the design is that not only Amazon, Flipkart, but all the other logistics service providers, like you mentioned, Shadowfax, etc., are also participating in that, and they also scale because of this. So it is, in logistics, it is a win-win situation because that spiral works for everyone. They also get new set of sellers, which up till now they have never got. And therefore, can they bring down their cost of delivery and thereby passing that benefit back to a seller? So I think the spiral, and that's why the word spiral is there, it works for everyone. And at a scale which is continuously expanding, the ability of the economy to bring the cost down is what is being attempted by the government of India also, if you see the way they are currently investing in infrastructure. I'll just give you an example. Uh, I come from logistics, so I can tell you a truck example. Or in an aircraft, if you use A380 or the bigger aircrafts, the cost of travel for each individual kilogram of material is directly proportional to the size of the truck. The, di the size of the truck, the bigger the size of the truck, per kg cost of moving that same kilogram reduces so much so that if you uh, make one kg of cargo move in a 60 foot container or 60 footer compared to that let's say you do it at about in 32 like to like you will drop the cost by at least 35 percent so your cost of supply chain is directly proportional to scale now why could we not move these large trucks before because we did not have roads why did we not have roads because nobody needed them why would you create roads when you don't need to move goods? Or why would you need four-lane roads? So now today, I was, day before yesterday, I was in Delhi and the minister was saying, Honorable Minister said, Delhi, Chennai, the distance has been reduced by 312 kilometers. 312 kilometers distance has been reduced because of the new expressway. And this is true for multiple other things. Samruddhi Highway is reducing the distance, increasing the speed. So both speed and distance, if you reduce by doing whatever you have to do, I am talking of the physical world of infrastructure, the cost of logistics will keep dropping down. And therefore, India is committed to bring down the cost of supply chain from 14 or the numbers double digits to 9% by doing almost there was in the morning there was a list about some 10,000 things are happening by the government of India, by individual players, the service providers, all of us are focused on bringing more efficiency by bringing down the time and cost to the market. So I don't know whether I have answered your question, but that is the direction in which the economy is moving. And this is not going to reduce the cost only for you as a particular uh, supplier, but it is going to reduce the cost of doing transactions in the economy. And that is, what I think, the endeavor that all of us are chasing. Am I audible? Yeah. yeah. 
So I have a question. How do uh, ONDC help a small artist uh, to come online and sell? So let me attempt it, and I'll then ask. So typically, the kind of markets that are at least being planned today, I don't know. How does a small artist sell today in the physical world? Uh, why I ask this question is, uh, so if you want to onboard a small artist, you should personally give him a manager until his onboarding is uh, done. After that, you should give him a training how to uh, pack and sell it. So even if you do this much, you may not uh, uh, hold the seller with you because in Amazon, if anything goes wrong, uh, if your performance is less than 2%, they, they'll block you. You cannot sell anything. But in ONDC, nothing is like that. Okay. They can sell fraud products easily, right? So, so let me tell you what MSME, so if, if I qualify every other business as MSME, and there are 16 million of them today registered from whatever I uh, read, but I'm sure there are more who can register. Let's say that you are registered in ONDC as a seller, and you will be exposed to the demand. So if somebody is looking for an artist output or, or somebody who can create that, uh, whatever an artist has to sell, if there is demand on it, there will be a fulfillment also which is available. MSME industry, we have a minister, uh, Mr. Narayan Rane, who is the minister for MSME. He has, he is on record, he gave an interview two, three days back where he said that there is a systematic training program in plan for all MSMEs as to how do they take advantage of e-commerce opportunity. There will be credit facility available because how will you go to a bank and say that I do this much business or that much business? ONDC data will actually help you build that case where you say that I have got revenue coming from this business and this is something that I can go to my bank and show that this is the proof that I do business at this in this margin, et cetera, et cetera. So what the platform is expected to do, and including the government and the various other support uh, infrastructure that is available, is that they are expected to train the entrepreneur. Finally, an MSME is also an entrepreneur. Train that entrepreneur to take advantage of the opportunities available, the payment system, the logistics, and whatever uh, infrastructure related things is available on ONDC. After that, the consumer rating and the consumer satisfaction with your product will determine how big your demand will be. That also again ONDC kind of network will help you because you will be able to, there, if there is a new consumer, who, they will be able to see you that how good as a seller are you and what is your rating. And therefore this is expected to give you support training as well as provide you with actual commerce enablers and that is the intent of this. Okay, I'll give you one example which has happened recently for me. I got an order from some X platform. Uh, I got an order at 12.30. We have shipped immediately within an hour or so uh, to the customer. Then uh, the same order has been cancelled within an hour. Uh, uh, that email notification we haven't got. We have shipped to the customer. So after a day or so, we have checked in the list that uh, that has been cancelled. So the net loss made for that product is returning plus shipping. It is 150 rupees net loss for us. So if I calculate overall uh, month orders like that, no, if my uh, returns and this thing is more, I may not continue in that platform. I'll come back. I doesn't want to mention that platform name, but I'll come back as a seller. How do how does ONDC address this uh, problem? So some of, see, I am not, uh, I cannot <laughs> give you more details about ONDC because I do not, I am coming from an industry and therefore I have an industry perspective. But what I would, I would reckon is that the same laws that are applicable today to you in the physical world will be applicable to you in the digital world. So for example, is the consumer allowed today to return your goods? Otherwise your contract will very clearly say that your products cannot be returned. They are 
only one way. In that case, you will have to take a prepayment. And thank you very much. There is a contract which will very clearly define that you will not take returns. So if the consumer has to buy, they will buy knowingly that there are no returns, which is how we do transactions in a lot of cases. When we book a hotel which is non-refundable, you will have to lose the money if you don't make it there. So those kind of laws already exist. It is not that ONDC is going to create a new law. A Consumer Protection Act exists today which protects the consumer. And you can go to the consumer court and argue out as a consumer if you, are, if you have been cheated. And so on, as a seller also, you have your rights. And I'm sure you will have the same rights. But beyond that, let's wait. I'm sure these situations will happen and they'll become clearer. Girija, you want to add? Yeah, just, just one thing. I think we have to recognize that not everything works the same way. Right? Just because Amazon is there, therefore I sell everything on it doesn't work. There are set of categories you'll buy based on the experience, right? Uh, or the set of categories which are not amenable to return, as you rightly said. Or they could be something else, right? I don't think anyone is coming and saying that I need to go and fill the universe. And, and only then we can call it a success. Which is what, at least what I was trying to say is, the use cases have to emerge bottom up. They have to be specific to that particular platform. And uh, uh, there are certain set of use cases which will not grow for the simple reason they will not be suitable to a disaggregated orchestration. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that the orchestration field is just that that use case is not relevant in that scenario. Uh, like if you take the lending point, you uh, talked about it. By definition, lending requires a level of KYC. You need to know who the customer is. And probably a disaggregation model may or may not be a right way to go about lending, as simple as that, right? I can just add one perspective from an organized uh, you know, sellers on how they manage this, the return policy. Though you have a 10-day guarantee on Amazon and Flipkart, so typically what they do is they look at your overall you know, purchase of you know, goods in your lifetime, be it an Amazon or Flipkart, and then versus the returns that you did. So there is a, if there's a disproportionately high number of returns that you did versus the, uh, you know, the products that you bought in, Amazon or Flipkart, they you know, dynamically change the contracts and say that no returns available for you alone. So those kind of algorithms are already there in place for organized retailers. So that's how you manage some of these uh, you know, returns which are disproportionately high than the products that you consume. Okay, our time is up, but we can take one more last question. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, Hal. So up. my name is Shiv Kumbar. I'm from Metro Cash and Carry. Uh, so based on the overall discussion, uh, we can understand ONDC, uh, the opportunity of the ONDC is big, great, yes. But as well, you can understand, uh, currently there are so many open points which need a closure. But as under the uh, government of India, we can anticipate things will improve, maybe in a later stage. Maybe a couple of years, maybe three years, four years in the down the lane. My question to Mr. Vishwajit, maybe, uh, just want to understand, or maybe the panel also can answer this. So just want to understand how the private firms prepared for this. Because once the one just maybe let's think in a positive way that yes, everyone, maybe the tie two, tie three cities, everyone came into the picture and they're able to start selling. So what about the private firms? Are they preparing from now on or what's next? Can you just repeat what exactly you are looking for? Like, are you asking like what kind of changes should be initiated right away, right now, to create that ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, my question is that, okay, once the ONDC comes into a larger picture, we can understand all the sellers from type 2, 3, 3, one, one, sorry, maybe coming to the, the main uh, area, and they start selling, and they're able to connect with the team. And the major players, just like Amazon, Flipkart, Big Basket, one, sorry, maybe. So what happens to them? How they play their role in upcoming years in the business? Okay, so see, first of all, uh, nobody knows the future is quite uncertain. So, so uh, you know, uh, that's with me as well. I won't be able to comment, you know, what exactly is going to happen in the next four or five years. However, it all depends, you know, how good you are creating the infrastructure for the customer. Because ultimately, see, the entire discussion is quite heavy towards that bringing in the SMEs and all the sellers, they will be doing good, right? And 
the e-commerce will increase. But we need, we shouldn't be, you know, forgetting that at the end of the day, it's all about customer conversions. If if there's no customer, then it it might not work for even ONDC, right? So in that view, I I'll repeat the same thing that maybe Amazon, Flipkart, other marketplaces, any other platform might be working going forward as a recruiting, you know, recruiting customers, recruiting journals. And ONDC can only take the pie from them. ONDC might not, what I am visualizing is a, it cannot be a recruiting journal because you need to understand that these platforms have already spent, you know, billions of marketing dollars and, you know, dollars on the technological front. And by the time ONDC will be developing these things, these people will be moving to a different, you know, level altogether. Like there was a lot of, you know, uh, discussion was happening on the chat GPT, right? But uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy, you know, explained this, that human brain is like that where, you know, people will be start, you know, inventing more than something, you know, beyond chat GPT. So, and it's been, you know, going on that, that's been the historical, you know, data also said like, whenever there's a disruption, we think about people, you know, come out with new, some new innovations. So I believe whether it's Amazon, Flipkart or any other platform, they will figure out and I don't think so, it's going to be a disruptor, ONDC is going to be a disruptor, we should take it as a like, ONDC might be helping, might help to increase the e-commerce pie rather than become a disruptor. So we should be taking it in a very positive way altogether. Last question. Yeah, yeah. here in the front. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pawan. I represent Swastik Masala and Pickle. See, my question is, uh, see, why can't we use our post office uh, logistic services, which is already there in the market, and it is, it is well penetrated. So most of our problem with, uh, with related to logistics part uh, will be, you know, solved <coughs> if you connect this, uh, you know, platform which is already established. Why can't we look at it? It is being looked at anyway. Most of, lot of companies are using it already. And you are free. Maybe post office will also be appearing on ONDC. So you can use post offices also via ONDC. It's okay. possible. Thank you. Thank you. I think I will, in, in, in brief, I will just summarize uh, three, four big issues which have come up. I think uh, Vishwajyoti mentioned if you look at it as a disruptor, look at it much more of ONDC as an enabler of bringing the e-commerce adoption to let's say 60, 70, 80 percent where everybody is able to access the market anywhere interoperated, cross-border. These are the kind of things that are today not available. In fact, it becomes far more democratic than what it is today. That is, I think, the first conclusion I would draw out of the conversations today, that it is a biggest enabler that has been thought of. The second part on which a lot of uh, unanswered questions are there, how will it bring trust? How will it bring, uh, how will it enable a relationship to develop between a buyer and a seller? And that is something that will always evolve. It is something that none of us can see. But I am sure if all of us start believing in it, it will start evolving. And the spiral may take longer or the spiral may be shorter, depending on how all of us start putting our belief in it. Will there be no hiccups? I am sure there will be some hiccups. There will be some frauds. Somebody will do cheating. Somebody will do all of that. But which is as good or as true in the physical world today, it will be the same phenomenon in the digital world. It is not going to be different. In fact, it will be more perhaps when people think that they can get away. But believe me, in this world today, you can't get away for long. And therefore, the natural laws of human behavior will take up. And I have this firm belief that if all of us, and we being people in supply chain and logistics and who understand this world of e-commerce, we are the people who have a responsibility apart from a privilege, that we all focus on this and use this 
so that the demands that we are chasing are arrived at. And if the country is growing at the current, I think it is the fastest growing country in the world. If it grows in the same way for the next four or five years, believe me, ONDC or version two of ONDC, version three of ONDC will keep improving from where it is today. Thank you very much.